you know, you may, somebody may say, oh, well, you know, I looked at the dollar against the, the yen or, you know, against some other currency and it looks like it's doing great. Okay, but how's your dollar doing against a loaf of bread? How's your dollar doing against a bag of groceries? How's your dollar doing against college tuition or rent? It's not doing well. And that is the lens that we need to look at it through. Hey, Joyful Warriors, Tiffany Justice with Moms for Liberty here today, and I'm very excited to uh, announce our guest for today's Joyful Warrior podcast, Carol Roth, who is still smiling as I look at her on screen, even though she has written a book called You Will Own Nothing, which doesn't sound fantastic, Carol. It's It, it sounds like a bit of a, a warning. So um, I know my name appears in this book, Moms for Li- Liberty, a little bit too, Um why don't you introduce yourself to the Moms for Liberty podcast crowd and, and tell us about uh, why we should be concerned about owning nothing in the future? Yes. Well, Tiffany, it's so nice to be back with you. I know our first uh, effort didn't quite make it to air for technical difficulties. So excited to do this and to include the work that you and Moms for Liberty are doing in the book. Um, you make multiple appearances. And so I was thrilled to have your insights and feedback as we try to preserve the American dream. So by way of background, um, I am a recovering investment banker, an entrepreneur, a multiple New York Times bestselling author, including of this book, uh, You Will Own Nothing. It sit on boards of directors. I'm, I'm sort of a collector of experiences. But where I really started was from a blue collar family. My father was an electrician. Neither of my parents went to college. Um, and I was the first person to kind of move to that, you know, supposed elite level. And um, one of the things that I have been very grateful for is the opportunities that America has historically presented where anybody has the opportunity to not only go out and seize that American dream if they do the work and and put forth the plan and, of course, have a little luck in the process. Uh, But, uh, you know, it's something that's very personal to me because I was able to do that. And as I have been an observer and a participant in Wall Street as a market commentator, as somebody who has advocated for wealth creation and this, you know, equal opportunity for the masses, it's something I've seen shift very significantly. And I have people who come to me and tell me, you know, I feel like I'm doing all the right things. I'm working really hard. I'm saving. I'm trying to put away a little bit for investing. And I still can't get ahead. I, I still can't buy a house in this country. I don't understand what's happening. So as I was exploring a lot of the topics that I talk about in the media on a regular basis, whether it is the debasement of the currency and the the fact that your dollar doesn't buy as much today as it did in the past, whether it was things like social credit or business social credit in the form of ESG, the Wall Street coming in and competing with you for a house, big tech basically renting your life back to you as a subscription or a service. The fact we have so many young people with this crazy amount of college debt that hasn't earned them a return on their investment, all of these kinds of things. I kept going, what's the through line here? Like, How do I take all of these big barriers that are being presented and present them in a way that makes sense to people? There's got to be a connection here. And I was just walking one day, one, two, three steps, and it hit me like a lightning bolt. Um, There was this meme that had been going around on social media, you'll own nothing and you'll be happy. And I was like, that's it, you'll own nothing. And to take it back even further, you know, when I first saw this go around on social media, you'll own nothing and you'll be happy. Like so many things that go uh, around on social media, and certainly things I know that you've been subjected to, things are taken out of context all the time, right? right? You see a little snippet of something. So I'm like, okay, where is this coming from? Oh, it's coming from the World Economic Forum. This is a group of business and political elite who get together for thought leadership. Like, there's no way a group like that would be predicting the end of private property. Um, Certainly not by 2030, which was where the prediction came from. It was their top eight predictions for the world for 2030. 
And so, you know, to me, having business leaders saying we're going to take to away, not take away, but you're not going to have private property um, was very concerning because as a, an advocate for wealth creation, I know that wealth comes from ownership. You have to own assets that have the opportunity to retain their value or to increase in value. So them saying you'll own nothing and and you'll be happy is very concerning. Um, A couple other things before I I return it back to you, uh, just some food for thought here. If you notice the language of that prediction, you'll own nothing. It's not will own nothing. This is not an inclusive prediction. This is not the people making the prediction feeling like they're in the same spot as you uh, with thinking that they will own nothing. So I thought that was something um, that stood out that I think plays to bear in this bigger thesis. And then the idea that you'll be happy, this sort of psyop, this psychological trick to get people to buy into the concept, no pun intended, of non-ownership that, hey, if you can just you know relax and, and have a YOLO life, like, uh, like the people on Instagram, you don't have to worry about it, everything and it'll all be taken care of for you. Wouldn't that be great? And I thought, you know, how sinister is that, that, you know, you're trying to get people to buy into that and make it easy for yourself to, to have people embrace this concept instead of having to force it upon them. But if you've studied even just a little bit of history, you know that people who have not had the opportunity to own things, <clears throat> excuse me, they have not been free. They have not been happy. They have not been wealthy. Many cases, they have starved and lost their lives. So just something that sounds so simple really has so many layers to it and really became the perfect foil for me to explain all these different things that are going on that are trying to create barriers to your wealth and freedom and individual rights. And then most importantly, at the end, one of the places you contributed to was how to fight back against that. And our moms are certainly fighting back every day in lots of different ways. And I think, you know, from seeing a lesson in your child's classroom and then saying, where is this coming from? Where does this stem from? You talk about the World Economic Forum. I think a lot of moms have come to know about the World Economic Forum in the wake of COVID, this idea of a great reset. And when I look at the World Economic Forum's website, they actually say, as we're slowly moving away from the heart of the crisis, we must invigorate global cooperation to achieve shared prosperity. And so American parents are looking and saying, okay, we've got all these new ideas being introduced to our classrooms. Capitalism is bad. Uh, You might not be a boy or a girl, right? Where is this coming from? And, And one of the areas that we've seen a lot of it coming from is the 2030 Sustainable Development Goals from the United Nations. So for our moms who are new to the World Economic Forum, the United Nations, let's talk a little bit about America Um, Some of the prosperity that we've seen in America and the growth we've seen in America over the past few generations and how the World Economic Forum and the UN, they're not that supportive of American prosperity and growth, it seems, and, and moms are figuring that out. So can you give us a little inside look at some of that global uh, cooperation that is happening right now that we, we're, we're seeing happen? Yeah, you have to think about you know, how unique the United States has been and how we've really changed the prosperity equation. And some of that you know, came from England before us, but really we accelerated that um, around the globe and have lived through the most prosperous uh, and best period of history, you know, just bar none. And the opportunities that we've created, not just for ourselves, but you know, to better the entire world have just been unmatched. And it really does come you know, with the idea of property rights and technologies that have democratized ownership. If you go back in time, really not that far back in time, by the way, you know, hundreds of years to these feudal societies, if you were part of the ruling elite, you owned land, and then you had all of these you know, people in your fiefdom who worked the land but didn't really have any ownership. And when you died, it got passed down to your heir, usually a son. And that was it. Those were the people who were the landowners and who you know hoarded the wealth and, and it was all for them. And people didn't have sort of the freedom and the agency and the sovereignty. What really came out of England was this idea of property rights 
that people could, you know, own things and that that would be protected. And with technology, that transition that we just talked about, that's very vertical, you know, from you know, father to son or grandfather to, you know, grandkid became horizontal. You know, we all had the opportunity to own more things. You know, first it might have been cows, but then it might have been businesses or even patents, intellectual property. And we all have something unique that we own, or maybe we take our capital that we've earned from our job and we have the opportunity now to invest it in something else to take a risk. And we own a piece of that. And that expands trade and expands opportunity horizontally not from you know a small group of people by genealogy, but to everyone. And that has allowed for prosperity. And it is because we individually have the opportunity to own things. When you own things, you have a, your skin in the game. You have a risk that you have taken either by your own blood, sweat, and tears where you've gotten some ownership of something that you've created, or perhaps you've risked your capital. But you do, you have ownership. You have a real stake in something. And so you protect it and you take care of it. What has happened with the, the World Economic Forum and groups that they're affiliated with these, in some cases, non-governmental organizations, which is hilarious that they have that label since they want to interfere, interfere with government policy and, and do so. And these sort of global groups of cooperation like the UN, who, by the way, we're not just picking on uh, for no reason. When I did my research, and I know you've done the same, Tiffany, their names pop up over and over again. And so if it happens once, twice, even three times, I could say, well, it's kind of coincidental. When every time you look up something and it's the same group of people involved, I can no longer say statistically that that is a coincidence. That is a coordination and it is a, a deliberate effort. So the World Economic Forum is founded by a, a man named Klaus Schwab, um, who just to pick on him for a moment because he deserves it, looks like he was cast from a Bond movie, like straight out of <laughs> Central Cast. There, Doctor Evil, Dr. perfect Evil. impression. One million. Dollars. I mean, just <laughs> it just like literally couldn't have picked a person who looks more the role than he is, and he has been at this a very long time. He created something called the European Management Forum in 1971, which was to put out his ideas. And that over time, um, because of changes in the geopolitical landscape and his persistence, has brought in more business and political leaders from around the world. And they eventually changed their name to the World Economic Forum. But his idea from day one in 1971 is this thing called stakeholderism or stakeholder capitalism. And stakeholderism is basically communism, fascism, any other ism that you can think of other than capitalism, um, repackaged and repurposed. Because I just told you about being a shareholder, right? You're an owner, you have a stake, you've taken risk. What his made up stakeholderism is, is somebody who has taken no risk who wants to free ride off the risks that other people have taken and bully and shape the outcomes. It's like the kid in the group project at school who has done absolutely no work all semester and then at the last minute wants to, to name the project and take all of the credit for it, okay? So he is the ultimate free rider, but it's not just getting the credit, it's really pushing agendas and, and shaping change and doing it where he has no real stake by making up this idea that there are other people that should have stakes and things like businesses. So give him credit that he is one persistent, you know what, uh, he has been at this for more than 50 years. And one of the things that he and his cronies do is they put out ideas and as they fail, because they're bad ideas that have been disproven not to work throughout history at you know, every single turn at scale, that they just repackage them and they give them new names. And so a lot of the things that we're seeing today are the same things that you know, they've been pushing and they just keep repackaging and, and, and putting a new bow and some new wrapping paper, but it's the same crappy gift <laughs> that's inside. Communism. You can put the nicest. Yeah. Right. Communism. The same. Yeah. The same. There you go. So communism with a nice, bright, shiny bow on right. this time. 
But Tiffany, I think that the, the people, you know, the moms that you talk to, they must be asking, okay, we understand that, but like, why now? So if he's right. been doing this for 50 years, why is it that all of a sudden this is actually working? These things that he's been talking about, how are these ideas that are, are fringe and are bad and that he's just been like trying to get anyone to pay attention to, why are they actually taking hold now? And so my thesis relates to the new financial world order. And I'm with you. This sounds super conspiratorial, but if you read my book, you will see that everything is impeccably sourced from the horse's mouth and that in terms of new world orders, it's not conspiratorial, it's history. So basically, as I said, we've been living through this period of prosperity. And one of the things and and one of the reasons is because the U.S. has been the global financial leader. We hold what's called the global reserve currency which means that things around the world, commodities like oil and food are priced in U.S. dollars. So when other countries want to buy them, they don't even use their currencies. They have to convert that into dollars and use dollars to buy them. And that has given us tremendous, tremendous advantages. As you can imagine, these things shift and change over time because our leaders are not responsible. So, you know, we've been in this pole position for about 80 years But before us, the British were in that position. And before the British, it was the Dutch. Mm -hmm. So this is something that changes on a regular basis throughout history. And again, you know, regardless of what you think of the president, and I'm sure I could probably guess a few things, I would think we would all agree that he's not a conspiracy theorist. He's lots of things. That one's never popped up. So go look at the speech that he gave the Business Roundtable, March 21st, 2022. It's on the White House's website. And it says, you know, the the financial global order changes every three or four generations, what I just told you. And then he goes on to say, there's going to be a new world order out there and we've got to lead it. When he says we, does he mean, when he says we, does he mean me and you? (laughs) So I surmise uh, that since he's speaking with the business roundtable, the business leaders of the largest companies in the United States, that that's who he's speaking to. He's probably not including Moms for Liberty. He's probably not including Carol Roth. Um, So he's talking to the elite of the elite. And so that really goes back to the thesis is that things are changing financially. We know that it happens on a regular basis. We know that our debt load here in the United States is unsustainable. The Treasury has said so. The CBO has said so. It's at 120 to 125% of, of debt to GDP on a public basis. We know that the Federal Reserve, which is our central Wait, Carol, bank, I'm going to stop you. Not- I'm going to stop you. Go back. Okay. I want you to say that again, and then I want you to explain exactly what that means. Talk about our the, the national debt. Speak about that for a moment. Okay, so the national debt is how much debt directly we have already accumulated for things we've already bought. Any time that we have, um, you know, less uh, revenue than the spending in a given year, that creates a deficit. You know, if we were to have more revenue and less spending, it would be a surplus. That's barely happened once on an accounting trick um, in modern times. So they always basically spend more than they're taking in from taxes and, and you know the limited other sources at the government level. Very irresponsible. We all know that that's not a way to run a household. You shouldn't be running a government like that. But the government is you know kind of more business oriented. So there's a level of that that is sustainable. Every time there's a deficit, it needs to be financed. So the government itself doesn't produce anything of value. So it's not like they're out running a business where they're like, oh, well, here's our money. We'll just pay that down. That doesn't happen. Um, They could sell off our assets. They could, I guess, sell off our national parks or something and raise money to cover the the loss. Nobody's going to do that. So they finance it with debt. They basically put it on the, the credit card, but they get a very low interest rate because they're the world's reserve currency. And we won't go into the wonkiness of that, but just trust me on that one. That's one of the privileges of holding the world's reserve currency, very low cost of financing for the government. So over time, all of those deficits that they've financed, which again, stuff they've already bought, is $32 trillion now, (laughs) which exceeds the entire output, the GDP of the the United States, um, you know, 
matches it and then exceeds it by 20 to 25 percent on a public basis. It doesn't include any debt that might be intergovernmental. It's just you know people who are other countries and individual investors. These are promises that they owe to that. It does not include what is called unfunded liabilities, which are promises that have been made to the American people and that there's a value associated with them, such as Social Security and Medicare over time. So if you were to add up all the promises and the debt as of the end of 2020, and we know it's gone up substantially since then, but at that point in time, it was $129.1 trillion. Wow. Okay. Wow. So again, the Treasury has said this is not a sustainable financial trajectory. Mm -hmm. The CBO has said this is not a sustainable financial trajectory. The International Monetary Fund has said basically a country can take maybe 70 to 80% um, of their GDP in debt before it really creates issues for countries. So we're at 120 to 125%. When you have that much debt as a country, you become desperate. The politicians become desperate because there's only so many things they can do in order to hold on to their power and their wealth. They need to get more money in. And so they can either raise more taxes from you, which we know there's only so much of that that they can do anyway. And plus, at a certain point, it becomes counterproductive. If you raise taxes too high, it has an issue in terms of the growth of the economy. and You actually collect fewer taxes. They can cut back on their promises. And we know that's really politically unpopular. Nobody's got the backbone to do that. In fact, in France, as you may recall, if you weeks ago now, uh, when they tried to raise the retirement age from 62 to 64, they burned down Paris. So, you know, imagine something like that in the United States. So their only other option is to continue to try to to raise debt. They've sort of run out of people who want to continue to finance the debt. And frankly, since we're, you know, one of the largest countries, uh, you know, on the planet, there are only so many countries that could even buy the debt. And there are only so many investors who could buy the debt. So what has happened in recent years is that the Federal Reserve, our central bank, has made up money out of nowhere to buy our own debt. And all that does is create more dollars with no extra productivity backing those dollars. So each one of those dollars is worth less, which is why that you're paying more for goods and services today so, in terms of inflation. So this, this is why, I mean, at some point I, I recognized there was some issue with chickens, but in general, my grocery, at one point I was paying like $9 for a dozen of eggs, but in general, that's come down a little bit, but in general, my grocery bill is probably twice uh, what it was yeah. uh, from a few years ago. And I know moms and dads are feeling that. So when Joe Biden is speaking to the business elite, of the United States of America and saying that there will be a new um, financial order, right? Um, you would think that the, the, business, the business leaders of the United States would want to, to work in service of the American people, their citizens. Is that happening? No, this is, you know, this is where people ask me to explain crazy. And it's very hard for me as somebody who believes in free markets, who has an abundance mentality, who believes in the Henry Ford way of doing things. Yes, I'm going to you know, make all of these cars and become wealthy, but I'm going to pay everybody a great wage so that they can afford to buy my cars. Right, That's how it used to be. It's gone completely sideways. And I think part of the reason, and this is, again, the underlying thesis that everyone needs to understand, why is this happening now, is that when financial stakes are shifting, people get scared, right? People don't like change. They don't like chaos. And when you have a lot to lose, you're very powerful and you're very wealthy, it's extra scary to you, right? You want to hold on to that power at all costs. So I think a lot of being rational goes by the wayside. They know the financial stakes are shifting. They can see that not only the debt load, but what's happened in terms of the U.S.'s status on a, a global stage and there's a whole bunch of signposts around that, and that there is going to be a shift that happens. And so, you know, Tiffany, just human nature, like, do you do you just like hope that that works out for you? Or if you're wealthy and you're powerful, do you do everything you can to try to hold on to every resource and to try to control that outcome? 
I mean, is there is there any example, you know, other than maybe a Mother Teresa <laughs> where somebody's, you know, not probably sure. doing the latter? So this is just basic human nature when stakes are changing. And with that debt load, which always makes, um, you know, desperation become front and center. And so this is why this is all happening at an accelerated pace now. On top of that, technology gives them the tools to be able to do different things that they couldn't do at scale on a different time frame. So those two things coming together are why you're seeing this happen today and not seeing it 25 years ago. Okay, so let's talk about the state of the American dollar globally. Just give us a picture, uh, and then we're going to dive into a little bit about the they. Who are the they? But talk about the American (laughs) dollar for a moment. 2023, we're recording this um, in uh, August. Um, How's the American dollar doing? So when the Federal Reserve holds the the world reserve currency, they have something that economists call the Triffin Dilemma. It's based on uh, the notions of the famed Belgian economist named Robert Triffin, who said, you know, if you're you're trying to have a a reserve currency, which is also your local currency, there are going to be points of conflict. Sometimes you're going to have to make decisions and it's going to be worse for your domestic economy than it is for the world or vice versa. And, you know, trying to stabilize that is a challenge. And these are the trade-offs you're going to have to make. What is incredible about the point we are at now is that the Federal Reserve has managed to do neither. They have managed to not hold the U.S. dollar stable in terms of its purchasing power in the United States or on the world stage either. And so, you know, you may, somebody may say, oh, well, you know, I looked at the dollar against the the yen or, you know, against some other currency and it looks like it's doing great. Okay, but how's your dollar doing against a loaf of bread? How's your dollar doing against a bag of groceries? How's your dollar doing against college tuition or rent? It's not doing well. And that is the lens that we need to look at it through. It's it's not, you know, how is it compared to, I always use the term, and apologies if this offends anyone, but it's just my sense of humor, the skinniest kid at fat camp, right? Just because, you know, you're the, the best of a group doesn't make it an actual good outcome. And so that's really where we are. So so we, they haven't held it stable here. And then on the international stage, as I mentioned, the same thing. We have exported this inflation that we've had, and now it's taking countries a lot more dollars to pay things, uh, pay for things like oil and food. We've seen that, right? We've seen the price of, of oil on a national basis continue to go up. We've had some fluctuations, but again, it's at an elevated level. The same thing for food prices. So imagine you're a country like China and you have to, to pay for your, you're in an importer, you have to get uh, energy and food for your people. And now it's costing you a lot more dollars to be able to do that. That becomes a a national security and economic security issue for your country. So these countries are not very happy with what we're doing. Um, We should not be happy with what the Fed's doing, although a lot of people don't understand the cause of it. They see the the symptoms, but they don't know what the ailment is and and how this has happened. Um, And so, you know, the dollar continues to, you know, continues to be the sort of strongest and and most powerful currency out there because it's backed by the productivity of the American people. But the Federal Reserve and the U.S. government are doing everything they can to, you know, basically throw a wrench into that. And so we have seen big countries get rid of some of their U.S. treasuries, which is how they store dollars. That's how, you know, because they're easily converted into U.S. dollars and they can earn a little bit of interest. That's how they store them instead of just holding a stockpile of cash or whatnot. So we've seen them lighten up on their U.S. treasury reserves. Um, interestingly, as they do that, they haven't been picking up another country's currency. They've been replacing that with precious metals like gold. So that's that's an interesting point. But we've seen that happen. And then we've seen um, the U.S. dollar be weaponized. So when Russia invaded Ukraine, the Biden administration went uh, and you got a bunch of their allies and said, Russia, sorry, you can't have access to your reserves anymore. And again, if you want to hold the world's reserve currency and then all of a sudden you can weaponize that, 
what countries around the world are going to want to let you be the world's reserve currency and, and price everything in your currency when you could just go, sorry, you can't have access to it at any point in time. So that was a huge mistake um, that will be a historical turning point. And then, um, you know, just things like other countries trying to find ways where they can trade and settle and get around the dollar. So you have all of these things going on on the international stage, which doesn't mean that the dollar is going away. But it does mean that we have less power. It does mean there's going to be less demand for it. That could ultimately cause inflation and higher cost of capital here over time. It could cause less access to products around the world that we're used to being able to access, including components that go into critical products and services. It could lead to a contraction the worst thing it potentially could lead to is war. Because if the U.S. can no longer use the dollar to you know, put forth sanctions or to get people to comply with regulations and taxes, and they feel, again, very desperate in their measure, you could end up with a scenario like that. So it's a very bad situation that has been entirely caused internally. This is not an external force that's making us do this. This is all derelict leadership. Uh, Fed and government derelict in their duty to support stable currency and to do what's right. And ultimately, you know, what it means for you as, as a mom and as a, a head of a household is that there's just been an epic transfer of wealth from Main Street to Wall Street. The reason why somebody you know who you know can't buy a house or you know who's having a to go into debt and, and having a crushed personal balance sheet is because the Federal Reserve and the U.S. government have been tilting the playing field. They've been putting their thumb on the scale in a way that transfers wealth to the tune of trillions of dollars from the average American to the wealthy and well-connected. And I think what we saw during COVID, and I, and I think a lot of moms and dads really woke up, and you and I have discussed this before, yeah. right? This transfer from Main Street to Wall Street, where you know you as a yeah. small business owner were no longer to keep, allow and to keep your store open, but Walmart was allowed to stay open or Target was allowed to stay open, right? And so let's talk about that. Let's really dig in. You say a, a, a transfer of wealth from Main Street to Wall Street. What does that look like for the average American? And why is it happening, Carol? And, and why are we allowing it to happen? Is there anything that we can be doing as citizens right now? I mean, there are so many th places for us to fight and fight back. And the financial sphere is so opaque that so many people don't understand the fundamental issues. So back in the 70s, there was a, a, a Saturday Night Live skit that was Dan Aykroyd as Jimmy Carter, because you know, this administration rhymes with the Jimmy Carter administration. And they were talking about money printing. And he was playing the president. It's a skit. You should definitely look it up. He, he was something along the lines of, you know, wouldn't you like to have a $50,000 suit and drive a $100,000 car? Everyone can be millionaires. And he's making fun of this idea of, you know, money printing and interfering in the free markets and basically saying, oh, everybody's just paying attention to that headline, but they're not understanding the purchasing power of the dollar. And that's what's happening you know, with inflation and, and with the money printing and, and all of that. Um, and so you know, it, that used to be part of the zeitgeist. And what happened in the 70s is you had protests. You would have uh, car dealers mail back their keys and house builders send lumber to the Fed. Like, we're not protesting the Fed. We're not protesting the financial situation. We're not filing lawsuits about this. I had, as we're recording this, I had tweeted today, like, why is it if a, a corporation's a person or an individual in the eyes of the law, like, why can a Wall Street investor buy my house and write it off, you know, and depreciate it over a few years as an investment, but I can't. Right. That doesn't seem equal in the eyes of the of the law. That you know, for all people, right? So you know, the, the, this playing field has really been tilted. And what has happened, you know, since the Great Recession financial crisis, is that the Fed has taken on more and more power and purview, and really accelerated that because you have to remember the Federal Reserve is owned by a bunch of big Wall Street banks. So that is who its membership is. And then it's basically a crony of the government. It gives any profits, which it hasn't had in several years, but it used to, to make turn a profit, 
back to the treasury. So it's like the ultimate like elite partnership of the government and the wealthiest and well-connected in the financial services industry, which by the way, you know, I don't know if you know this, but financial services is the number one industry in the United States. I mean, this is this is what we sell. So this is, you know, kind of the the big point here. So in 2010, um, there had never been any corporate institutional Wall Street money in the single family home market. So fast forward to 2022, CoreLogic said that more than one out of every five homes that was sold that year was sold to a corporate buyer. You're talking like BlackRock buying up. Homes. I'm talking about companies that are supported financially by BlackRock, by JP Morgan, by Capital One. There are companies called American Homes for Rent, Tricon Residential, and so on and so forth that are going out and buying tens of thousands of family homes. And they're doing this with the intention not to improve them and then give it, you know, sell it to another family. They want to rent you the American dream. And so they're taking more supply out of the market. They're coming and competing with you with this free, cheap capital that they got over a period of like you know 12 to 14 years. And they're coming in. And what you have to understand is for families, the house across households in the United States is the number one asset on household balance sheets. It is how most families in this country make wealth for themselves and legacy wealth for their families. So the idea now that you're going to have a corporation come in in a time when we don't have enough supply of homes to begin with, purchase the homes, take them out of that you know ability for you to make an investment in, rent them back to you, so now you don't have that wealth creation opportunity, and then marry that with the social credit issues that we've all been going through, and certainly... Um, you and all of the moms who are listening are very aware of this. But if the the government wants to push a policy, whether it's you know no arms or no gas stoves or whatever it is, how much easier is it for them to do you know via their Wall Street cronies who are now your landlords is saying this is against the the landlord deal that we have for this house versus if you own your own domain and you have that sovereignty, how easy is it for them to say? Well, I'm sorry you said something on social media. You know, we're worried about you. We think you're a domestic terrorist, Tiffany. Apparently, I've heard that one before, right? So you can't have a house. We're not as a corporation comfortable in underwriting this. What do you do if you give up that sovereignty and that agency and that ownership to corporate America? These are the kinds of things that we need to make people aware of and we need to fight back on both sides. Because people who are selling their houses need to understand, I want you to make every dollar possible, but maybe that last thousand dollars you don't need and you should sell it to a family instead and understand that you're going to pay for that in spades down the road um, if you end up, you know, going the other direction. Maybe you need to get together with your housing association and put some rules in place you know, we don't need to have everything be a government decree. We can take these actions by ourselves and affect change. But there needs to be a giant awareness um, because, you know, we can obviously try to start fighting this at the Fed level and, and, and fighting um, for l- rules and regulations that curtail their powers and don't allow for this to continue. But there are things that we can do to preserve things like ownership for families. Sure. So this theme, again, your life as a subscription service, you've talked about this a lot, yeah. right? Let's talk about big tech. What role is big tech playing in all of this? Because technology is a blessing in many ways, right? <laughs> yes. uh, but also uh, big tech and government, we've seen big tech and government working together uh, quite a bit, right? Well, and, and big tech this time around, you know, has become these de facto governments, they're providing, in many cases, infrastructure. Uh, they are providing services where there's no competition or very minimal competition. Many of them have more users than even the largest countries in the world. Many of them have market caps that are bigger than the, the national output, the GDP of almost every country in the world. 
And while that's not an apples to apples comparison, it's still pretty crazy scope. And when we talk about all the debt that the U.S. has on its balance sheet, big tech doesn't have that. They have really strong balance sheets. So they're really in a really good financial position. And they're dealing with the same kind of issues that, you know, we would think of from government, you know, things like, you know, free speech and access to basic infrastructure. I think of something as simple as, you know, our phones, you know, you have something and you like, do I, do I own this? What do I own? I own some plastic. I own some glass. I own some microchips. If I don't have access to the operating system, this is not worth anything to me. The, the, the operating system is my gateway. And then once I'm in that operating system, I need the email platform. I need the social media platform. I need the payment systems and the whole ecosystem that goes along with it. In terms of operating systems, there are two companies that cover more than 99% of not just the US, but the entire globe with their operating systems, Android by Alphabet and the Apple iOS system. That's not capitalism. I have no free choice in this. I have two choices. It's a duopoly. And so, you know, both of them have been generally okay on operating system access so far as, as far as I can tell. But what if there's a personnel change or what if they just change their mind? I mean, that is not protection of my rights in the digital sphere. I, I shouldn't have to be cut off from modern society because Apple doesn't like something that I said online or because I ate too much bur too many burgers. You know, if you think of something like our telephones, you know, back in the day, for those of us who had landlines and maybe rotary phones and the like, there used to be a law in place that says because you have this, you know, this anti-competitive stance and, you know, we're giving you the privilege to, you know, be one of a handful of people that can have this infrastructure, you have to provide service to everybody, no matter the reason. So whether you were a criminal or we said something on the phone lines you didn't like, it didn't matter. Your provider of service and everybody had access as Americans to that service. We need our rights protected in the digital sphere because you have these companies acting like governments. And in some cases, they're doing the government's dirty work. You know, if you've paid attention to the Twitter files or the information that's come out of Facebook slash Meta, how many times has the government worked with these platforms to say, I don't like what this person is saying. It doesn't jive with the narrative. Take them off the platform, take their information off the platform. So if they're just extensions, you know, kind of like the Federal Reserve is sort of an extension of the government, in many cases, these tech companies either are an extension of the government or are running into the same kind of, you know, governmental issues because of their scope and scale and the fact that we, you know, live in digital worlds and they are the rulers of those digital worlds. So what does it feel like for you to be a truth teller in all of this, to be seeing these, <laughs> to be seeing these <laughs> patterns and to have the history and the knowledge that you do within the financial markets and to see um, everything becoming so corrupted and operationalized in that corruption? What has that been like for you? Okay, so I just really wanted to be a game show host. <laughs> I just wanted to like make people laugh, give away prizes, jump we can up and do down. That. Like, I feel like we could I make mean, that happen, but yes. Okay. Okay, please. It's so I'm generally a happy and jolly person. Yeah. You know, if you follow my Twitter feed, I try to have a lot of fun. I try to walk through life in a not so serious manner. I love laughter. It's really hard. It's like ignorance is bliss. I wish I didn't know this stuff. I wish I didn't have to write about this stuff. Is you know, like, how did you like writing the book called You Will Own Nothing? I hated it. I, I wish I could have written a happy book that tells you lots of happy and great things. And maybe, you know, that will be my next book. Um, I've also, you know, like you, I've suffered personally from it. You know, I've had, you know, the tech bros do not like me. I have been unfollowed by people I thought were my friends and really big names in tech because, you know, I'm pointing out the deficiencies, which you would think they'd want to be allies and help correct, and they just don't want to have any of it. I've lost many corporate opportunities because I've been, you know, somebody who has consulted with at a very high level some of the biggest companies um, on the planet. Uh, you know, I've had people who call me a, a right wing conspiracy theorist when I'm telling you 
This came out of Joe Biden's mouth and it's on the White House's website. Please explain where the conspiracy is. Like, I'm I'm happy to to have you push back on my research or like disagree, but like I'm telling you what they said. So it's it's a tough position to be in. It's not a position that I thought I would be in. Um, but I would imagine somewhat like you, it, it it's so important. You know, we're just at this really critical time. And I, you know, I think back to the founding fathers and the things that they gave up for freedom and liberty. And I have been able to succeed beyond my wildest dreams, beyond my parents' wildest dreams, beyond my grandparents' wildest dreams, um, and to seize this American dream. And it just, it can't go away. It can't go away because there's nobody else. You know, when when we stepped into, I'm getting like a little emotional here, but when we, when the U.S. stepped into Britain's shoes, like, that was an okay handoff because, you know, we were this land of freedom and opportunity and individual rights and protections and freedoms. Like who is there to step in if the U S fumbles here, everybody who's waiting in the wings are dictatorial, tyrannical, frightening. There is no next bastion. Like if there was like, you know, X country that was like, well, you know, this is a, a new land of opportunity. So it'll be okay. We could all just, go move there and make that work. That doesn't exist. So we need to do this for ourselves. We need to do this for the children of this country. We need to do it for the world because people from around the world come here to participate in that American dream and count on us because there is no other option. And that's the the real rub here. There is no alternative. We have to to right the ship. We have to stand up and fight now because if we lose this, you know, we've been through this incredible period of progress. Like what stands in front of us is a very dark time, like a second coming of a dark ages. It feels if like we don't that, turn Carol. this around. It feels right? like it. Yeah, I mean, it, it, and so while you know, I'll be honest, I think a lot of moms and dads across the country maybe didn't have the knowledge uh, about the financial mess our country was in, right? And and we may be learning right now. We're learning from you even yeah. in this podcast right now about some of the different concerns and the different things that we should be aware of. Uh, the, the level of the shocking, I mean, it's been shocking to see what's happening yeah. all across the board, even from a cultural uh, perspective, right? I happen to believe we're in the middle of a cultural revolution. When you have a situation where we are giving minor girls uh, double mastectomies, um, that feels like the dark ages to me. And so, um, you know, we have, and, and, and our literacy rates, Carol. So we'll talk about that for a I second. Know. I know I've made you aware of that. You, you, can't look, uh, you can't look around the United States right now and not notice how poorly our children are doing in public schools. What is a nation, uh, what's the future of a nation from a financial perspective if you have two-thirds of, of Americans who cannot read or write or do math? Yeah, it's it's certainly not a good outcome because, you know, I think the thing that people forget when they talk about money, which I talked about, it's a proxy for productivity. Mm. You think about what it really stands for. It used to be if I wanted something and I was a, a doctor, let's say I wanted milk and I had to go to, to the farmer and go, I need some milk. Do you need some, you know, medical attention? Oh, I don't, but the blacksmith does. So if you give it to the blacksmith and I'll get the, you know, the, the horseshoe from the blacksmith and then you can get the milk, you know, it's super complicated. We invented money just as, you know, an easy way for us to trade between our productivity that we produce. If you don't have productivity, there is no growth. There is no opportunity. That's what the money stands for. What's what the, what the wealth and the where the wealth and prosperity comes from. And so, to have a generation of people who aren't able to go in and to be productive and to be innovative and to seize that opportunity on one hand, and then who've also been trained psychologically that they're victims and that they shouldn't own anything and that they should be on the government dole and the government you know will take care of them is just basically walking us from something that looked a lot more like free market capitalism to something that looks a lot like full on communism and that's i mean the talk about the founding fathers rolling in their graves um you know to see in such a short period of time how that happens and so you know i appreciate the fact that 
we all have different domain expertise. You know, you have something that's slightly different, Tiffany, than I do, but it's all very related. And it's why we have to to work to, you know, educate people, cross-educate people on these important ideas and to stand up for all of them because they are all very much interrelated. I mean, the idea even that, you know, the, the largest predatory lender in the United States is the U.S. government. You have the U.S. government who has enabled a wholesale transfer of wealth from teenagers to colleges and their administrators with not better outcomes. College is the cost of college has exceeded the GDP and wage growth in terms of its growth. College cost growth to GDP five times and wage growth eight times. Wow. So they are not contributing to our growth in our economy with these degrees. They are not contributing to the growth in individual wages. They are contributing to their own growth to the point. And I, you know, I say this in the book, but I coined this a long time ago. They call Harvard a a hedge fund with a university Mm -hmm. attached to it, right? They become these, these massive financial institutions and have just been sucking up wealth. So now you have all of these kids who have wrecked personal balance sheets that they're not going to be able to pay for because they never knew what return on investment meant to begin with. Their parents don't know what it means. They were told they have to go to college. Now they have these useless degrees. They're not keeping, you know, they're not growing the GDP with them. They're not increasing their wages and they're never going to be able to own a home. So we're back to you will own nothing. (laughs) We need to create this level of awareness at a very young age. We need to bring financial literacy back to young people for them to, to take a real interest in it because Part of the reason why the government's been able to get away with this is because people just haven't been, you know, keeping tabs on them. Yeah, and I and I think we see that moms and dads are seeing that constantly. We're looking at, you know, even history scores coming out. The children are not being taught about history, right? And we try to talk about history. You've seen me try to talk about different dictators and 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 monsters in the world that have used the education system to indoctrinate the youth, to create a wedge between the parent and the child. And yeah. we're seeing that happen now. And so the concern being, if kids aren't learning how to read in school and they're not learning how to do math in school um, and they're not learning about history, they're very easily controlled. And so they won't ask questions, as you're saying. But we have an opportunity. Uh, First of all, I think we have an opportunity to create a a financial literacy program with Moms for Liberty and Carol Ross. So I'll be in touch with you about that. Oh, that sounds a great idea. I'm I'm loving that. I love this is real time brainstorming and problem solving. I think that's super interesting. Okay, let's do that. And and let's talk about that. But, you know, I, I think even your idea about the HOA, I think it's time for Americans to take a step back and say, how do we throw sand in the gears? How do we take our country back, right? Moms for Liberty does that by reclaiming and reforming school boards. Tina and I served on school board and we saw, wow, these elected yep. positions have a lot of power. And if you can get the right people into these positions, you can really change the, the movement and the momentum of your school district. I believe in the American people. I have great concern about the federal government Um, But I believe in the American people. And so when we're electing representatives, Carol, and those representatives' voices are being shut out because you have administrations that are using uh, the power of the pen through executive orders to change the culture of our country, right? Just some tips and hints as we close out. I loved the idea. If you're selling your house, think about who do you want to sell it to? Do you want to sell it to someone owned by BlackRock or a lender? Or do you want to sell it to a family that is going to, you know, use that house as a family home and then be able to hopefully create some wealth um, around um, that stability. So I love that tip. I think that's wonderful. Just a few more as we close out. Yeah, well, I'm going to say, so, you know, continue on your line of thought. I think that the local involvement is so powerful and really focusing, you know, local jurisdiction, state, There's so many opportunities, even something like property taxes can be entirely reformed through that mechanism. That's not something that's happening at the federal level. That's happening on a state by state level. And you want people to not be forced out of their homes because the property taxes continue to increase. So having a level of scrutiny on that and letting people keep more of their wealth or be able to stay in homes or to maybe get a slightly bigger home, making it easier you know, for 
for um, entities to build, to, to build up the supply so that you don't have people having to move out and you get those like-minded people who stay in your community. I think those are all really incredible things that you can do. I think um, you know some of the things, and, and we talked about so much and there's just so much more to talk about, um, but you know there could be chaos that comes you know down the road. Um, so for that, I think there's a couple of, of really big macro things I want to leave people with, and certainly it depends on your own personal financial situation sure. objectives. So if you have a financial advisor that you trust, these are important things to talk about. But the very first thing is, you know, we started this with the elite predicting that you know you will own nothing, and of course they're going out and they're owning everything possible. So I want you to ignore everything it is that they say and do what it is that they do. They are out there buying homes. They are out there buying productive land. They are out there we're seeing central banks buying precious metals and loading up on those. They're buying tangible things in a form factor that they can control. You want to buy tangible things that can retain and appreciate in value in a form factor that you can control. So copy the things that they're doing. They're doing it to protect themselves. So we need to copy them. We need to not listen to them. We need to copy them. And then I want people to diversify as well, because one of the big challenges with this is that we can see trajectory, but we don't know timing and catalysts. You know, as I may have said before, you know, every time we've had a shift in the new financial world order, Um, it's been preceded by war. Not every war brings about a new financial world order, but each one that we've seen has been preceded by war. So that could be a catalyst or there could be, you know, these central bank currencies. There are a lot of things that could happen. We don't know which one's going to happen first. And even if we had the general plan today, there are so many geopolitical catalysts that could happen that could completely shift and change things. So you really need to fortify your portfolio. And I know this is hard right now because you're struggling Inflation is eating away, but you have to practice austerity. And I know your kids may want that extra pair of of sneakers or you might want to take that like extra fabulous trip. Like now is the time to find places where you can cut back and you can take some of that spending and start investing it into a broader portfolio of things, again, that you can control. Um, If you work or your uh, spouse or mate works for a company, Try and get stock options in that company. Try to get ownership. There, there's a, a new movement that you know, some of these conversations are bringing about where whether it's a public company or a private company, they're offering up ownership in that business. So if you're going to help business, you, you want an actual stake in it. Try to get that. If there's a 401k matching plan, take advantage of that. Also look at precious metals. Also look at home ownership. You may have to downsize. You may have to be in a city that's, you know, a slightly different one than maybe you thought. But you really have to be thinking about these things because there's so many macro issues that not only affect your your wealth, it affects your sovereignty. You go back to you cannot be at the behest of a corporate landlord. You cannot have these people owning everything you do. I mean, they will own your life. You will be an indentured servant. So whatever you can do to put yourself and create that plan to be able to be, you know, that uh, fr- stealing from Seinfeld in a different way, master of your domain, oh. um, you want to do that. You, you want to be in charge and have that ownership to the extent that you can. I think it's wonderful advice, Carol. We're going to have you back on to talk about maybe some lessons uh, that we can teach our children about money and saving and and, and, some, yes. and some financial literacy lessons we can give our kids. I think that's going to be a wonderful program to work with you on. I want to thank you for your bravery cool. because I know, um, and, and all of our moms know, in, in the position that you were in and many of the positions that our moms were in, it would be very easy to turn a blind eye to a lot of this and to just yeah. continue living uh, a life where uh, you don't ask a lot of questions and you just kind of go with the flow. Um, but we know that the generation of, of children that we're raising are going to live with uh, the consequences of the choices that we make today. Thomas Paine yeah. said, if there must be trouble, let it come in my day so that my children may live in peace. And mm-hmm. I, I always think as difficult as COVID was, um, and and for whatever reason um, that it, it, it happened, um, and I think you know there are a lot of as we've talked about a lot of these things that have been considered to be conspiracy theories. Now we've waited them out, right? A lot of the information that the government or that big tech has kept from us or has have worked to keep from us now 
you know, over time we see, no, there, there was validity, right? In some of the questions that people were asking or things that were being uncovered that we have an opportunity to take action. And right now in this moment, we have been blessed with an opportunity to wake each other up and to support each other and to really keep America a free country where we can live uh, in a culture of liberty. And so I'm just thankful for you. I'm thankful for your courage for writing the book. I think our moms are going to absolutely enjoy listening to this podcast. We'll learn, they'll learn a lot. They're going to have some questions. Uh, so maybe we'll do even a webinar, a follow-up, so they can talk with you a little bit. Um, and thank you for putting yourself on the line because, um, to me, you're an American hero, and uh, oh. we, we really salute you. So thank you, Carol Roth, for joining us today. Go out and get You Will Own Nothing um, by Carol Roth. Carol, how can people follow you on social media so they can get updates and, and, and laugh once in a while too? Cause you're right. Your tweets are pretty <laughs> you, you have some great tweets. <laughs> so first of all, I want to just thank you as well, um, for what you're doing. You know, I consider myself somebody who, you know, researches and finds the information, but you are a person of action. It's, you know, we all have different strengths. And so mine's on the information side, yours on the action side. And I think yours is even much more valuable. So the fact that you've been able to get people to go out and do these things is tremendous. And I appreciate your contributions to the book. So I want to thank you for that. And I want to remind people buy hard copies of books yes. because the other thing that's happening is that they're changing them. So unless somebody comes into your house with some scissors, they're not going to be able to change this. This is what I actually said. I have no idea if you get a digital copy, what's going to happen. Um, but on top of that, um, my handle across social media is at Carol J S Roth. Um, right now I'm the most active on the platform formerly known as Twitter, which I still call Twitter. But I, you know, when I lived in Chicago, I still called it the Sears Tower, even though it hasn't been that for decades. So I won't let go of the names and the branding. I'm nostalgic. Uh, and uh, but like I do Instagram once in a while and some other things once in a while. But if you want to get the meat of it um, until the, until they throw me off, they've already they've already shadow banned me on Twitter. Uh, but uh, until they throw me off of Twitter, that's where you can find. Wonderful. Carol, thank you so much for joining us. Really appreciate you.